Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Today, we are joined by Pro Hananda Zaniado with an introduction to chemical biology. Pro got his bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Barcelona and a PhD from the University of Oxford. He gained extensive experience in photochemistry and photosynthesis, along with specialized expertise in synthesis for biology and medicine. At present, he is a postdoctoral research associate in medicinal chemistry and a lecturer in chemistry at Jesus College, Oxford. With that, I'm very sure he will give an excellent talk. Let's turn it over to Paul. Hello, and thank you for joining us on this introduction to chemical biology. I am Paul Hernandez Nero, a postdoctoral researcher in medicinal chemistry at the University of Oxford, working with Professor Angela Russell. But first things first, what is chemical biology? Well, chemical biology is a relatively young field that emerged in 1990s. It is an interdisciplinary field that stems from bioorganic chemistry, biochemistry, cell biology, and pharmacology. So it uses techniques and concepts stemming from all these fields. Nature Chemical Biology Journal defines it as chemical biology is the field that combines the scientific ideas and approaches of chemistry, biology, and allied disciplines to understand and manipulate biological systems with molecular precision. However, the definition of the field goes well beyond that, and I'd like to recommend this article from Nature Chemical Biology 2015 that asks many academics in chemical biology, how do you define it? Now, there's many definitions there, but some things I'd like to highlight is the emphasis on the diversity of this discipline and the focus, which is the pursuit of new discoveries or technologies, trying to address biological problems with a chemical mindset, but overall always applying chemistry to understand and perturb biological processes. Now, these definitions make it really clear that this introduction today cannot be comprehensive. And um, this is such a huge interdisciplinary field and trying to cover it all would be meaningless. So instead, this introduction today will focus on some case studies to exemplify some key techniques and technologies in chemical biology and the application in drug discovery. Now, chemical biology is not only applicable to drug discovery, it can apply to any biological problem and any context. But thinking about the audience today of synthesis workshop, I feel like discussing it in this context of drug discovery can be most useful. So this is the structure of today's introduction. Um, I started by discussing the definition of chemical biology and what is the scope of this introduction. And then we'll move on, on to discussing the drug discovery process, how chemical biology can impact it. And then that will be exemplified in three case studies. One on activity-based protein profiling, the second one on DNA encoded libraries, and the third one on photoaffinity labeling. And finally, there'll be a summary and further reading for anyone interested. Now, many of you are familiar with the drug discovery process, but I thought it'd be good to summarize it here for the purposes of this introduction. Now, when one tries to develop a drug to treat a particular disease in a patient population, uh, the initial stages are concept development. What disease do we want to target and how are we going to do so? Then lead generation is the initial search for compounds that will be able to have an impact on this disease. Lead optimization is the development of these compounds, changing their structure to get them into a property space and by activity space that is required. Then this is further elaborated into preclinical evaluation. And then if all that goes well, the very few compounds that get there will go into clinical trials. If they are successful, then ultimately they'll go into the patient population and have an impact in their lives. There are two main ways to perform the early stages of drug discovery process. One is target-based and the other is phenotype-based, and we will now discuss them both. Now, the target-based drug discovery process starts with, as the name says, the target. Now, a target is a biomolecule, usually a protein, that we have enough biological data to believe that if we affect it somehow, be it agonism, antagonism, inhibition, that will have a positive impact on a disease. Now, when we're confident this is the target that we would like to pursue, uh, we can say that we have performed target identification. So once we have identified a target that we want to pursue with this drug discovery process, the next stage is to develop an assay that will allow us to quickly and reliably measure how compounds affect it. For example, if we're looking for 
kinase inhibitors, we would develop an assay that allows us to measure the rate of phosphorylation of these kinases in a quick and easy way. So not often this relies on fluorescence. And in this example here, we have a plate, and this is how usually these assays are run, so we can run many compounds at once, where fluorescence is directly proportional to activity. So in this case, we have these compounds on these wells that looks like have some activity. By running this assay many, many times on many compounds and do this screening, we could finally find some hits and leads. Phenotype-based drug discovery, on the other hand, starts with assay development. And the assays that this will be focused on are cell assays, because now instead of trying to first identify a target and find molecules that have an effect on this particular protein, now what we are looking for is compounds that will have an effect on full cells. So therefore, we'll be measuring a phenotype, for instance, cell death. And that could be used to then screen many, many compounds. Many compounds have been screened on this assay. We now have a short list of compounds that have the phenotype that we're looking for, for instance, cell death. But because of the nature of the assay, which is a full cell assay that is target agnostic, we do not know what targets we are hitting. The next question is, how do these molecules cause this phenotype? What are they interacting with? within the cell. And this is where chemical biology plays a crucial role on trying to understand how these molecules interact with a particular protein in the cell, for example, and then that ultimately leads to phenotype observed. Use of a lot of different techniques such as mass spec, electrophoresis and many others, chemical biologists can then ultimately understand how the molecules within cells cause that phenotype and can identify the particular target. And this process is called target deconvolution. To summarize, there are two very different ways to start the drug discovery process and identify what compound we want to move on to lead optimization. One is target-based, and as I said, starts with identifying a target based on previous biological data, then doing an assay development, screening all our compounds and finding some hits and leads that would know how they work, or at least we have a good hypothesis, which is that they target a specific protein. And the other is phenotype-based drug discovery, which starts the other way around, without any target in particular in mind, an assay development that uses whole cells that allows us to measure a phenotype. Then this cell assay is used to screen many compounds, and identify some hits and leads that we have no idea how they work. Then chemical biology techniques are used to understand how these compounds affect cells through target deconvolution studies. Now, chemical biology has a, an impact on all stages of drug discovery. But the ones highlighted here, target identification, screening, and target convolution, are the stages that I think are most impacted by this field. So because of that, we will be focusing the case studies on these three areas. Case study one will be talking about activity-based protein profiling in the context of target identification. The second case study, we will be discussing DNA encoded libraries and how they can be used to screen billions of compounds and try and find active ones. And finally, the third case study will be focused on photo affinity labeling and how it can be used to identify a target from a phenotypic screen. First case study will be on activity-based protein profiling. The first case study will be focused on the discovery of new targets. Now, the discovery of new targets is a crucial step in the treatment of diseases, and it's done in many, many ways. It can be achieved through data mining, i.e., investigating links between difference in genes, gene expression, RNA on protein levels, and how these link to disease. It can be also achieved through uh, phenotypic screening and target convolution. However, there is a huge gap between what we have so far identified as the druggable genome, part of the genome that we can uh, interact with to cause an effect that we think can improve disease, and the total number of protein encoding genes. There are 30,000, more or less, protein encoding genes. However, there's only, we have only identified about 3,000 genes linked to disease. And out of these 3,000 genes, only 500 of them are currently targeted by small molecules. So you can see how there's these huge gaps that have a huge potential to treat new disease by identifying new proteins that we can interact with. An alternative approach to finding new targets for the treatment of disease is instead of looking for links between protein expression or levels, study the links between protein activity of an enzymes and disease. Now, there are many ways in which one can accurately measure the expression or levels of proteins. 
However, the challenge on this new approach is how do we measure the relative activity of a family of proteins in living cells? How do we identify specific enzymes within a family, let's say hydrolases, that under a disease state are more active than under healthy conditions? So activity-based protein profiling, its goal is to identify highly active members of a family of enzymes. And to do so, it uses probes. Probes are small molecules that can be used in biological assays and biological studies to investigate and learn more about biological system. And they are the powerhouse of chemical biology. In activity-based protein profiling, these probes look like this. They have a reactive warhead, a linker, and a reporter tank. The reactive warhead is an electrophilic group that reacts with conserved active site nucleophiles in the enzyme family. Many different reactive warheads have been developed so far. For example, these phosphorus compounds are serum reactive, these amides are lysine reactive, and these selenium compounds are cysteine reactive. And the key here is that they are selective for a particular family of enzymes. The linker is several atoms length and it can be a PEC linker, so oxygen ethers, or it can be many other structures. And these have a big impact on the productivity, but we will not discuss them in detail today. And the linker with links is a reactive warhead with a reporter tag. Now this reporter tag is a group that allows visualization, isolation, identification and or quantification of labeled proteins. So the reactive warhead will react with nucleophile in the enzyme family and the reporter tag will allow us to then pull these and study the proteins that we have labeled. There's two main classes of reporter tags. One are fluorophores that will allow us to identify and see what proteins we have labeled. And the other are biotin based, which will allow us to separate the labeled proteins from the rest of the proteome. Our workflow for activity based protein profiling starts with a proteome. And this is all the proteins. These are then treated with the probe that has, as I said, a reactive warhead and a reporter tag. If the reactive warhead is selective for, let's say, serine proteases, all the serine proteases in the cell will be labeled with the probe covalently. And depending on the reporter tag, we will be able to do different things with the labeled proteins. If the reporter tag is a fluorophore, we can then do electrophoresis to visualize the labeled proteins. And this is separate the proteins based on usually size. And we will see, for example, here that we have a band, a particular band that we are labeling. So it looks like it's very selective for a particular size of serine proteases in this case. If the reporter tag, on the other hand, is biotin based, we will then be able to affinity base purifier and separate the labeled proteins from every other protein in the proteome. If this is followed by digestion, we can then do mass spec and identify the labeled proteins based on their sequence. So we'll be able to say this probe labels these specific enzymes in the proteome. How does affinity base purification work? Now it works based on this pair, streptavidin and biotin. Streptavidin is a protein that is extracted from a bacterium with high affinity for vitamin B7, which is biotin. And this interaction, we can exploit it to separate proteins from the proteome. Now, how does this work? Biotin binds extremely well to streptavidin. It's the strongest known non-covalent interaction in nature, and it has a KD of 10 to the minus 14 molar. So this interaction is really, really tight. Whenever we have biotin-labeled proteins and we mix them with streptavidin, the labeled proteins will stick to it. And we can exploit this affinity to then separate them. And how we separate them, I'll discuss in the next slide. So if we have uh, resin or beads with stratavidin, so on solid form in, let's say, a column, when we then treat it with a sample that contains some proteins that are labelled with biotins and some that aren't, the proteins that are labelled with biotin will stick to the resin or the beads, while the ones that aren't will continue flowing and be eluted. If we then Wash several times with protein buffer, all the proteins that are not labeled will be fully eluted, while the ones that contain biotin will stick. This will then allow us to, while using an elution buffer, then separate the ones that are labeled from everything else. And this is a really useful technique um, in chemoproteomics to try and identify what specific proteins we are labeling.
that I have introduced the main techniques and workflow of activity-based protein profiling, we can discuss the case study, which is on a paper called Enzyme Activity Profiles of the Secreted and Membrane Proteome that Depict Cancer Cell Invasiveness by Jasani et al. in 2002. Now, serum hydrolases are one of the largest enzyme families, and they compose 1% of gene products. Comprehensive understanding of their activity um, can help better characterize disease and discover new therapeutic targets. Here, what they did was to do a comparative study of the activity of serum hydrolases in a panel of human cancer cell lines. And their research question was, does serum hydrolase activity correlate to key cancer properties such as cell invasiveness? So as I said before, activity-based protein profiling is one of these techniques that is based on probes. And the probes they used look like this. They have a reactive warhead that we discussed before. It's electrophilic and reacts with nucleophiles in the enzyme, uh, in this case, serine. And on the other side of the probe, we have a report attack. And the report attack that they used was one, rhodamine, that was used to visualize the label protein, and the other, biotin, which was used to separate the label proteins from everything else. This experiment started with separating the secreted, membrane, and soluble proteome, and treating these three different parts of the proteome with the probes. With the idea that then the specific enzymes that we're interested in will be selectively labeled. And we can see here how these are selectively labeled. Now, in the first instance, the report attack was a rhodamine probe, i.e. a fluorophore. And this is what they got back when they separated the label proteins through electrophoresis. And we can see that these are a lot of different bands. So they've been able to label a lot of different proteins from a lot of different cell lines. So we have some breast cancer cell lines some melanoma, some unknown categories, and you can see that there's many, many proteins that have been labeled, and we can see some patterns that may or may not be interesting. However, the key question here to start with is, how do we identify these patterns? How do we know what is what? They are based on size, so the bigger proteins will be in the top and the smaller ones on the bottom, but their position here is not enough to be able to identify which exact protein is which. Where mass spec comes into play, so in parallel, they performed the same experiment, the same labeling experiment, but now the report attack was biotin. And as I said before, this can be used to perform affinity-based purification, digest, and then through mass spec, be able to identify what sequence the proteins have and therefore which proteins have been labeled. What allows us to do is then to draw these labels on the proteins. So we can see that BCHE has been labeled, PSPL1, SAE, Cathepsin A, and many others. And there are some clear trends that then they investigated further. Next was to analyze all the different activities that they had measured in across all these different cell lines and try and find some trends and clusters. So the activity profiles were merged and analyzed across cell lines, and that allowed them to first identify uh, profiles and link them to invasiveness. So we can see here on the slide that they were able to categorize some. Cell, cancer cell lines as particularly invasiveness, and they were even able to recategorize this breast cancer cell as a melanoma, MDA, MB435. So because, um, and this is all based on similar labeling profiles across cell lines. What they were able to do next, I think, is really, really interesting, which is that within these fingerprints that uh, correlated with high invasiveness, so these particular enzymes that when they have high activity, they link to cell lines with high invasiveness, they could identify a particular one, KIAA1363, as an enzyme that its activity really correlates well with it. Instead of having to measure so many and draw a picture of a lot of different activities, they were able to identify this one in particular and measure its activity in a lot of different cell lines and see that when the activity increases, as we can see here from the left to right, more enzyme activity, indeed the invasiveness of the cell lines also does. So they were able to identify this target, clearly is important in cell invasiveness and what they suggest is that it should be further investigated. So they were able to identify a target that potentially has some impact in cancer treatments. So this is the end of First case study. I mean, I hope it exemplifies how this particular technique 
activity-based protein profiling can allow chemical biologists to identify new enzymes, in this case KIAA1363, that could be further investigated to treat diseases. So let's move on to case study two, where we will be discussing DNA encoded libraries in the context of HIT finding. HIT finding is a really important part of the drug discovery process because it goes from, um, if you remember, we first identify a target and this is in target based drug discovery. And the next thing we want to do is to screen thousands and thousands of compounds to try and find some molecules that will interact with the target of interest. Now, traditionally, this is achieved through high throughput screening. And as I said before, this requires the development of assays that can be run in parallel. So if, imagine we have more than a million compounds, we would have more than a million wells that would then run the specific assay. And in this instance, high fluorescence would mean these compounds are interacting with the target in the way that we want. However, some key limitations of this approach is that it's very expensive. We require millions of compounds to start with. It has a relatively low hit rate. We get few validated hits from running millions of compounds. And it also ultimately requires having synthesized all these compounds, maintaining them, keeping um, them in stock, checking they are pure and they haven't degraded. So it's a very, very expensive process. However, is there a different way? Could we, instead of running a million compounds in a million wells, could we screen billions of compounds in a single well? I mean, this sounds really challenging, but is it possible? Well, DNA encoded libraries offer an answer to this. And we will now discuss how this is possible. Library. Uh, with many, many building blocks one, two, and three that we can see at the top of the slide here. And the data could be represented like this, where we have each axis is one of the building blocks, and if and the size of the marker was the activity. So we can see some active compounds, we can see some trends where we can see these lines one, two, and three, that clearly building block one did not have a huge impact um, of, but clearly these motifs did. So these were further elaborated in the next stages. The thing to do with the DNA encoded library hit is to form off DNA synthesis. So prepare these compounds, as I said, off DNA and check that they actually are active against the enzymes. And indeed, these three specific hits are very active. So the IC50s against RIP1 are in the nanomolar range, which is really, really good as a starting point. And they were further elaborated and the compound that they ended up continuing to development was GSK481 with an EC50 against a RIP1 of 10 nanomolar that translated really well into their cell assay with no changes to the EC50 value. Some other aspects of this compound is that they were able to uh, co-crystallize it with a RIP1 construct to see how it binds into the pocket. Um, and we have here on the left and they also were able to check for its selectivity. So this is a representation of all the different kinases in the proteome, and the red dot is the compound, sorry, is the kinase in particular that GSK481 targets, so RIP1. And we can see that there is a single red dot, so it does not inhibit any of the other kinases, or at least not within the assay concentrations that it was run. So, GSK-481 was then work advanced into further development because clearly it was a great starting point. It is an incredibly potent compound and really, really selective. So this, I think, is a really beautiful example of how DNA encoded library allowed a drug discovery process to move forward from really great starting points that were obtained through the screening of billions of compounds in a single well. Finally, we will now move on onto case. DNA encoded libraries are based on using DNA as a barcode. And the key thing in this technique is how these libraries are built. And this is what we'll explain now. So if we start with uh, the first reagent, so we have a particular small molecule bound to a very small DNA strand. And each DNA strand has an identifier and the sequence means can be linked straight away to the small molecule. What we can do is then we can split this mixture of different mo small molecules with their specific barcodes into a lot of different wells. And on each well, we can do one reaction. Now, 
if we follow one of the fragments, if we follow this red fragment, the red fragment in well one will be added to this cyclopentyl, and well two, a cyclopropyl, and so on and so forth. And in each well, what we will do is add to the barcodes of that well a specific sequence that will say that has been added a cyclopropyl, or these in this well we've added a cyclopentyl. The power of DNA encoded libraries is that then we would pull all these different molecules that have been specifically tagged into a single well and split it again. And for example, do a second round of reactions. And you can see that very, very quickly and combinatorially, we get millions of compounds. And the key thing here is that each of these millions of compounds, really often they are billions, are all tagged with a specific DNA sequence. A huge library of compounds can be, then be, again, pulled into one flask, and then we can do the assay to try and identify which of these molecules is active against a particular target. Now, the way the assay is run is slightly different to the ones before, because we said, can we, instead of running millions of wells, do it in a single place? However, this requires slight changes. Now, instead of running and dividing one molecule per well, what we do is we incubate the mixture of billions of compounds with an immobilized target protein. So the target protein that we are interested in, instead of being in solution, it will be immobilized against, for example, a bead or some sort of solid support. And then when this is incubated, when this protein is incubated with the billions of compounds, the one that the small molecules that interact with it will essentially stick to the solid support because it will stick to the protein. What we can do, and this is very similar to what we discussed with biotin streptavidin, is then do washes that will elute the unbound ligands and will leave us with the immobilized protein and the active ligands that contain the little tag. What we can then do is elute these active ligands, and the beauty of this technique is that the little tags can be amplified through PCR and then sequenced, and what we can then do is identify which ligands were bound to the particular protein based on the DNA sequence that we had. Now, this, to me, the first time that I heard of it, sounded almost like science fiction, because there's so many chemical constraints. And if you were asked to do these chemical reactions in a flask with DNA, the key thing here is how do we do this chemoselectively? Now, the chemistry to make these libraries has many constraints. I have a huge example. It's a big example of how chemistry can be achieved under very complicated and delicate conditions. So these libraries and this process is achieved in high dilution environments. So the concentration of small molecules is really, really tiny. We always have to have some water as co solvent because the DNA otherwise would degrade. The conditions have to be very mild pH 14, and we cannot really heat too much. The scale is, again, tiny, but we take advantage of affinity base purification and PCR to then amplify the tiny signals that we were measuring. And finally, not all reagents can be used when building it because they have to be compatible with the DNA itself and water. So uh, this means that many oxidants cannot be used, and same for many Lewis acids. To use how DNA encoded libraries work and they are built, We'll talk about a specific example, this case study. Um, and the paper, the reference on the top right of the slide, is DNA encoded library screening identifies benzyl B14 oxazepine 4 ohms as highly potent and monoselective receptor interacting protein 1 kinase inhibitors by Harris et al. And this is a paper from J. Medchem 2016. Uh, in this paper, their goal was to develop inhibitors of RIP1 for the treatment of inflammatory diseases. However, they had some challenges their uh, search for initial hits. At first, and this is a drug discovery process performed at GSK, at first what they did is they screened a focus library. Now, RIB1 is a kinase, so what they did is they screened a library that contained kinase inhibitors. And what they achieved through this process was they found this hit, which they developed further. However, they couldn't develop it all the way into preclinical studies because it had poor developability. Uh, the properties of these compounds weren't very drug-like. The molecular weight was relatively high. The log P, which is a measure for how greasy these compounds are, how lipophilic these compounds are, was far too high, and therefore their solubility was really poor. 
and that limited their development as drugs. They followed that uh, initial library of kinases with a high throughput screen of their whole compound library. Because in their first instance, they couldn't find chemical matter that was good enough to go all the way to the end and to patients, they moved on and went, well, could we find a different hit to start on? And what they did is, as I said, they screened the whole GSK library with more than 2 million compounds, and they found a new series of hits. And these look much better. They are highly potent and selective. They're really nice and small and really efficient. However, the issue here was that when they moved on to in vivo studies, they saw that they had really poor oral exposure in rodents. So these, this lead series of compounds had to also be discontinued. Now, at this stage, you've been through a lot of work. So they thought, well, what we can do next? And then what they did is they moved on to screening DNA encoded library, which has more than 7 billion compounds. The 7 billion compounds were then subjected to the screening conditions that I described before. They were treated and incubated with immobilized target protein, then the unbound ones washed off, and the ones that were bound, the DNA was amplified through PCR and sequencing. And this allowed them to identify a lot of different hits, a lot of different compounds that were binding to the protein of interest. Now their library contained three building blocks. So it was a sort of a two chemical step on DNA study three, which is focused on photo affinity labeling. At this stage, I think it's worth revisiting one of your earlier slides from the presentation. So we discussed at the beginning how the drug discovery process can start from two different approaches. One is target-based, where we identify a specific target that we want to interact with to cause a particular phenotype to treat the disease. And the other one is phenotype-based, which starts with the development of a cell assay that is target agnostic. We develop a cell assay that will allow us to measure specific phenotype that we're interested in, but irrelevant of how this phenotype is caused. So we do not know what target, what protein we are interacting with. All we know is that we can measure a phenotype that we're interested in. Once this assay is developed, many, many compounds can be screened on it, and we can then identify some hits and leads. This stage, the main challenge is then this question. How do I identify the molecular target responsible for the phenotype that we are observing? And as I said earlier in the presentation, chemical biology has a huge role to play in this area of targeted convolution and validation. And it is a complex process that involves many, many techniques that is well beyond the scope of this introduction. But I thought we would summarize one of the techniques used in this process, which is photo affinity labeling, which allows selective labeling of target proteins that then through chemoproteomics can ultimately be identified and validated to link the small molecules, the small molecule activity to the phenotype. Target deconvolution is quite a complex process, and I said that it's, it's beyond the scope of this introduction, but I think it's worth sort of summarize the whole process. So the way it starts is through the finding of a small molecule that has a phenotype that we're interested in, but we do not know the target or the mechanism by which this phenotype takes place. The next stage in the process is target identification that is achieved through multiple orthogonal target methods, which are really nicely reviewed in the review that I'm referencing here on the top of the slide. These uh, target identification techniques will not give one single answer, unfortunately. They'll give us a list of targets, a list of proteins that could be responsible for the phenotype observed. And the, the job of the chemical biologist is then to prioritize these targets and validate them. And target validation has two main questions, which is, can we confirm that the target is being engaged by that molecule? And can we validate that by interacting with this target, the phenotype that we are observing makes sense? Can we link the two? If the answer to both questions is yes, we can confirm the small molecule engages physically with the target, it interacts somehow with it, and that interacting with a specific protein can cause the phenotype observed, then we have finally achieved a validated target and the target convolution process has been successful. Many different techniques that can be used in this process, and this is a summary of the many different ones that 
that can be used. And they vary from computational prediction. Can we link the structure of the small molecules straight away to some specific targets? Chemical proteomics based methods, which will be discussed later on, on photofinity labeling, but also activity based protein profiling that we discussed before. Functional genetics can we, by mutating out a specific gene, lose this phenotype? Can we create resistant strains? And finally, some phenotypic profiling can we uh, compare the phenotype that we are observing and specific biomarkers with compounds that we know how they act? With this specific one, can we see some parallels with other compounds that we know how they work? Uh, because it's likely that if we have two different molecules that have very, very similar phenotypes and they cause very similar processes in the cell, they're likely to be targeting relatively similar pathways. But as I say, this introducing all of these concepts will be beyond this introduction. So what we will be focusing today is on photoaffinity labeling, which is part of chemical proteomics and is a target enrichment methodology by affinity purification, which I'll introduce now. Photoaffinity labeling, a little bit like activity-based protein profiling, begins with, and a crucial part of the whole process is to find probes that resemble the initial hit compound that are still active. Now the probes have, instead of two parts, they have three parts connected by linkers. The first part of the probe is the ligand, and this is the part of the molecule that will bind to the target and cause the phenotype that we are observing and trying to investigate further. The second part of the probe is the reporter tag. Now we discussed reporter tags in the case study one, where we talked about activity-based profiling, and they tend to fall between uh, into categories, either fluorophores or labels that will allow affinity purification, i.e. biotin. However, because photoaffinity labeling relies on the excitation of functional groups, we tend to avoid fluorophores that could interact with this process and instead use alkynes that when we can then form a click chemistry, which is compatible with proteins and many other biomolecules, we can then append fluorophores later on, avoiding the use of these moieties during the photoaffinity process. And finally, the third part of the probe is the photoreactive. And this is the functional group that, upon irradiation, will covalently bind to the target. Now, traditionally, uh, benzophenones were used and RL azides, but now more recently, the ones that are most popular, the azurines. And these all get excited with lights that range from 254 to 100 nanometers. And for instance, a benzophenone turns into the Di radical that then can covalently bind molecules and give these sort of compounds. The ARL azide can then extrude nitrogen to give the nitrine, and these nitrines can then either rearrange and give these sort of compounds, label covalently proteins in this other way. And finally, diazerines can decompose to give carbenes that can then covalently bind the target. So all these different photoreactive groups ultimately lead to the same result, which is covalently linking this initial probe that we're designing to the proteins that it's interacting with. The goal of photoaffinity labeling is to identify what proteins are interacting with our ligand. Now, as we said before, the probe is designed to mimic this ligand, and it has um, a structure that resembles it quite a lot, together with a report attack and a photoaffinity group, a photoreactive group. The workflow for photoaffinity labeling experiments is this one that we have on the slide. And it starts with, again, the proteome. So it can either be done on living cells or on lysates. Um, and then what we can do is incubate the cells or the lysates with these probes. And then what's going to happen is that the ligand will interact with the enzymes or proteins that it usually does. And this is why it's important the probe resembles structurally um, the initial ligands that we're interested in. Once we have incubated the proteome with a probe, the probe will, as I say, hopefully, bind and interact with particular proteins, in this case, this one here. What we can then do is irradiate this mixture with UV light, and that will cause the photoreactive group to decompose, create high energy intermediate that will ultimately lead to covalent binding between the proteins and the ligands. Then what we can do is this proteome can either be subjected to a click reaction 
that will link the reporter tag to a 404, and then that can be subjected to electrophoresis. And this will lead to visualization of the label proteins. Or, similar to activity based protein profiling, we can then do either a click to biotin or the reporter tag can be from the initial, from the outset biotin itself. And then we can do affinity purification that will allow separation of the label proteins from every other protein in the proteome that followed by digestion and LCMS will allow us to identify which proteins have been labeled. Now, in photoaffinity labeling, it's highly unlikely that we're going to only label one protein. So what we tend to get instead is volcano blocks, which represent proteins that have been labeled comparatively more or less than against the control. So we have here proteins that have been labeled more versus proteins that have been labeled less. And we can then select some of these proteins and further validate them and try and then link the particular proteins labeled to the phenotype and allow us to identify how this process is taking place. The case study that we will be using to discuss both affinity labeling is the one from the paper entitled Chemical Proteomics and Phenotypic Profiling Identifies the RL Hydrocarbon Receptor as a Molecular Target for the Eutrophin Modulator Azutrimid by Wilkinson et al. And this is a paper in Angavante 2020. The context of this photo affinity labeling experiment was the Shen muscular dystrophy, which is a fatal X-linked muscle wasting disease affecting 1 in 3,500 to 5,000 boys. This muscle wasting disease is caused by a loss of function mutation in the dystrophin gene, which is one of the biggest one in the genome. Now, dystrophin is a key protein in muscles that prevents the waste and prevents their degeneration. Eutrophin was identified as a paralogue of dystrophin that, when upregulated, can prevent this dystrophy. And therefore, eutrophin upregulators were investigated by the lab. Eutrophin, which is the compound here on the top right, um, is a first in class eutrophin modulator that was identified through a phenotype based screening. Now, it went through successful animal and human phase 1 clinical trials, but ultimately was withdrawn during phase 2 clinical trials due to lack of sustained clinical efficacy. Azutrimis is a eutrophin modulator and it increases the expression of eutrophin. That's a phenotype that was observed in the phenotypic screen. However, the mechanism by which this takes place was unknown. And this is what the paper describes, this identification of how this process takes place. So similarly to activity-based protein profiling, in photoaffinity labeling, it all begins with the probes. And the authors designed and synthesized a number of probes that mimicked azutrimid, but while having a photoreactive group. And these were probes two and three. They both contain a dazzling group that would decompose under exposure to UV light or carbene, and an alkyne handle that could be used for the click reactions during their workflow. In these experiments, it's always key to have a structure matched negative control and that means photo affinity probe that looks very similar to the active ones but is completely inactive or at least there's a window of concentrations where it is not active and does not produce the phenotype and this is what this compound is and finally a soluble competitor to compete out this photo affinity labeling probes now one of the key limitations of azutrimid is its poor solubility so this did not allow them to use azutrimid in competition experiments, so instead they use this compound 7 when they needed to do so. Now with these probes designed and synthesized, the first thing to do is to check that they also cause the phenotype. And this is what this plot looks like. So on the y-axis we have eutrophin, fold change, all that untreated, untreated being the DMSO control. On the x-axis we have different concentrations of the compounds. Now what we see here is that when we treat the cells with azutrimid in red, there is a 1.5 to 2 fold increase in eutrophin expression. And this is what the phenotype that we're trying to investigate. And both probes 2 and probe 3 do cause an increase in eutrophin as well. Uh, probe 2 more so than probe 3. Finally, the negative control, probe 4, does not change eutrophin expression, which is key for further experiments. So they were able to validate these different probes as useful for the proteomics workflow. So the workflow for chemoproteomics looks like this. So starting with cells, these were incubated with the probes that we discussed in the previous slide. 
After a certain amount of time, the light was turned on to irradiate the Nazarenes and cause them to turn into carbenes and covalently bind to the target enzymes or proteins. The cells were then lysed, and the lysate, which is essentially a protein soup, was then subjected to a click reaction with a fluorophore containing an azide. Now the proteins labelled were containing fluorophores, we could use electrophoresis to visualise them and see how many proteins we have labelled. Now this is what the results look like, and we'll walk through this. This is the gel where we can see the fluorescence after the click, and what we see here in the rows is the key thing here is there's little labeling with the MSL, so that's always good. However, when treating with probes, they're not, they're not that selective, there's a fair amount of labeling. But if we focus on the areas highlighted here, probes 3 and probes 4 labeled many proteins. However, there are specific ones that could be outcompeted with the soluble competitor 7. So the key thing here is the proteins that are labeled with probe 3, the active. A probe that causes the phenotype and that can be competed out with the soluble competitor 7. These proteins, therefore, are proteins that are specific to the phenotype and that should be investigated further. So, after seeing this relatively selective labeling of specific proteins with the active probes and being able to compete them out with the soluble competitor, what they followed that with was a, an experiment where now the cell lysate, instead of doing a click with a fluorophore, they performed a click with biotin, they performed affinity purification, digestion, and mass spec. And the results obtained when you do these sort of experiments look like this. So these are volcano plots, and we are not going to go into detail of exactly what they represent, but what's happening here is in these proteins were significantly more labeled when in the probe group versus the probe and competitor. And what this shows is that these proteins are likely genuine binding because it can be competed out by a probe that also causes the same phenotype. And on this right-hand side plot, what they can see is a correlation between proteins labelled in two different comparisons. So active probe versus negative control and active probe versus active probe and competitor. And what these experiments allowed them to do was to shortlist a number of proteins that would be investigated further to test whether any of these are responsible for the phenotype. So we have been describing allow them to shortlist a number of proteins and targets that could be responsible for the phenotype to, let's say, a dozen. But how do we go from a dozen to a single validated target? There needs to be some further narrowing down. What the authors did in this instance was a phenotype profiling. And what this meant was measuring 148 different biomarkers across 12 different cell lines and compare the effects that Isutumid had on these biomarkers. So we can see here um, a representation of they treated these 12 different cell lines and measured a lot of different biomarkers for azutramid. They got some biomarkers were higher, some were lower. And what they did is compare that profile to the profile obtained when treating these cell lines with compounds of known targets. Now, if the profiles are similar, it's likely that they are acting through similar targets. And that's exactly what they did. They saw when performing this phenotype profiling was a really good match between Izutramid, at the time a compound with unknown target, and CH223191, which is an unknown AHR antagonist. What we can see here is all the biomarkers measured, somewhere up, somewhere down, and we can see that there's a really, really good match between the two lines, one representing Izutramid and the other this compound of known target. Therefore, it's likely that if they both have the same effect on all these different biomarkers, they act to the same target. And that's how they were able to shortlist AHR as one of their key targets that were then going to further validate. In other words, that they have been able to shortlist AHR as a potential target responsible for this phenotype, the next question to ask to validate it was, can we confirm that these ligands are interacting with AHR, that they're engaging with it? And the second one was, can we validate that through interaction with AHR, we can link that somehow to the upregulation of eutrophin. Now, to confirm target engagement, they performed a Western blot with AHR-specific antibodies. Now, the way that this works is they did exactly the same as the previous workflow. So they treated the cells with these probes. They then were able to label after irradiation with UV light. So they had a covalent, a covalent bond. 
But now instead of using a fluorophore that would show all the proteins labeled, instead they use an AHR specific antibody that will only show the one band that is AHR. And the key thing here is that what they saw was that when treating with PROP3, they had a really strong clear band. They were indeed interacting with AHR and labeling it specifically. The negative control band, the compound that did not have a phenotype, was indeed not interacting with AHR. And they were able to compete PROP3 with both Zutramid. So the band goes weaker, therefore they both are competing with the same protein to interact. And they were able to also do the same with the competitor 7 to reduce that the intensity of that band by adding these ligands. And what this is showing is that all these compounds are interacting with AHR and they can compete each other out. To further validate target engagement between AHR and Azutramid, what they did next was to measure the KD when mixing these two partners. Azutramid is intrinsically fluorescent, and what they saw was a decrease in this fluorescence where with increasing concentrations of AHR. And this was further proof that these two partners are binding to each other with a dissociation constant of 15 nanomolar. This experiment was followed by further target mechanism investigations that allowed them to confirm AHR as the validated target for this eutrophin upregulation. So I hope these three case studies have been able to showcase how big an impact chemical biology can have in the discovery process and how varied a field it is. Today we've been talking about techniques so different such as mass spec, photochemistry of diazarenes, or chemistry done in water using DNA as barcodes. But all these different techniques ultimately joining together to tackle biological problems that could have a huge impact on people's lives. I hope this introduction has also been able to showcase um, the discovery achieved and the problem solved by using chemical biology. In the first case study, we discussed how activity-based protein profiling allowed the identification of a new enzyme that can predict cancer invasiveness. In the second case study, we saw how billions of compounds could be screened in a single well to find better starting points for the development of new drugs. And finally, in the third one, how to solve that puzzle, how to ultimately identify which target and which protein in the whole proteome is responsible for a particular phenotype observed when using a compound. If you are more interested in chemical biology, I'd recommend further reading that includes this book here, Chemical Biology, Learning Through Case Studies, but also reading the perspective on Cell Chem Bio in 2017 called Joining Forces, the Chemical Biology Medicinal Chemistry Continuum. With that, all that's left for me to do is to thank you for your attention. I hope you have enjoyed this and see you next time. Bye-bye. Let's thank Paul for his excellent lecture. I hope the three case studies he introduced give you a clear sense of how the drug discovery process works and the role of chemical biology in it. If you want to learn more, don't forget to check out the recommended further reading. And if you enjoyed this episode, please support us by subscribing to the channel. See you next time.